Welcome everyone, good morning. We are happy to have you here joining us today for the first part of our two-part webinar series, Journey of a Fossil. To view live closed captions in English and Spanish, please click on the external link we have dropped in the chat. And for our guests watching on YouTube, the link to closed captions in English and Spanish is in the video description below. My name is Agnes, and I work with the education team at the Labria Tarpins. And when, so when an Ice Age animal is trapped in asphalt thousands of years ago, its journey does not end there. For us, it is just the beginning. Have you ever wondered how we get our fossils out of the asphalt? Well, today you're going to find out as we join our excavators, Laura Tewksbury and Sean Campbell from our current active excavation site at La Brea Tar Pits. Laura and Sean will take us inside Project 23 and show us how they excavate fossils, what tools they use, and what we do with the matrix, which is the dirt surrounding the fossils. We'll introduce an exciting fossil find and continue the story of this fossil in part two. You may have an idea of the animal we will be talking about from some clues we gave you in our opening slides. And you will have the chance to become part of this special animal story. So I'm joined today by my colleague Cassie, who you will see a little later, and off screen by Rachel, Jessica and Julie, who will be helping to organize your questions. Thanks so much, team. So we're going to be together for about the next 45 minutes or so. And after Laura and Sean are done sharing, we're going to answer some of your questions. Now, this might be a different format of Zoom than some of our students joining today are used to. You won't see any of your classmates, your teacher, or any of the other people watching this program today, and we can't see or hear you. You'll only be able to see and hear us. So since we can't actually see one another, I do want to take a moment to make a shout out to students joining us from all of today's schools. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for taking the time to join us today. Since we can't see any of you and you can only see us right now, we're going to use the chat function to ask questions. During the presentation, you can click on the chat box, type in your question, and Laura and Sean will answer as many as possible during your Q&A at the end. Your chat box might look a little different depending on what device you're using, but the icon looks like this right here. Your questions will only be seen by the museum staff who are running the Zoom right now, and the chat box is currently closed, but we will open it, open it up during the presentation. We ask that all of our friends joining us today only put questions or comments related to the presentation in the chat. This helps us make sure we get through as many questions as possible. And to respect our panelists and our staff assisting with the program, we also ask that we use appropriate language, please. And folks not following a code of conduct may be asked to leave today's program. So we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. And Laura or Sean might actually answer a lot from during the presentation. But if we don't get to answer your questions today, I encourage you to write it down so you can learn more about this animal on your own. So if you'd like, go ahead and grab a piece of paper and pencil, and you can record your experience while you're watching today. You can note down any of those questions you have, maybe a few facts you learned, or write a description of what the fossil looks like. So here are some vocabulary words that you may hear this morning. Feel free to jot them down or maybe grab a screenshot so you can review them later. Just going to run through them really quick. We have extant, extinct, fossil, matrix, Pleistocene, procyon motor, maxilla, and mesocarnivores. And then to give you an idea of where Laura and Sean are joining us from today, I want to share this map of Hancock Park from our museum. So if you've ever visited us before, some of this may look familiar to you. Laura and Sean are right here in our compound in Project 23. So let's get started. That's why we're here, right? So let's head over. I'm going to switch my camera over to Laura and Sean, and we're going to meet today's Ice Age animal. And you will see me in again in a little bit. So we're going to start, first of all, with Sean. Hey, Sean. How's it going out to Project 23? Hi, Agnes. It's going great. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for joining us today. All right, so let's get into it. So welcome everyone to the La Brea Tar Pits and Museum. We're at Project 23 right now. So where did Project 23 come from? So we're in Hancock Park, which is a county park uh, where on, on Wilshire Boulevard and Fairfax and Curzon. And this park was uh, donated to the county and to our museum specifically to preserve and protect all the fossils that are found underground at this location. So uh, we have a next door neighbor that's also a county institution, LACMA, the art museum. And when LACMA built an underground parking structure for their visitors and guests back in 2006, they found 16 new fossil deposits between 15 to 25 feet underground. 
So they had big construction equipment. They were excavating. They were uncovering all of these things. And paleontologists were on site to make sure that we could find where all of those deposits were and then figure out a plan to remove them safely in a timely manner so that they could have their parking structure and we could preserve and protect the fossils. So what they ended up doing was uh, they would find the lateral uh, stretch of the deposit and expose it as much as they could and then give it a couple more feet of extra space uh, to contain all the fossils inside. And they hired a tree moving company to box up the material. So they came in and they boxed up the deposit or the portion of the deposit that they found. And then they made a floor and then tied it all together with metal bands and uh, nails and screws. And then a crane ripped it out of the ground and then brought it to the position that it's currently in where we're working and excavating on it. So, uh, this material was brought here in 2008, and there was 23 boxes generated, which is why it's called Project 23. And since 2008, we all the staff members, including Laura and myself, as well as a bunch of volunteers, have put in a bunch of time and effort in excavating all these deposits and finding all these fossils. So each one of these deposits, generally speaking, contains many thousands of fossil remains. So as you can see this image behind me, these are all real fossils from box 13. So box 13 was the 13th deposit found for that 2006 excavation of that parking structure. And uh, they brought it over here in 2008 and then it sat here for a few years while we were, while we were working on other deposits and then eventually we opened this up. Uh, and we, this is actually part of a big grant, uh, National Science Foundation or NSF awarded uh, grant money to the La Brea Tar Pits, University of Maine and University of uh, Merced uh, to excavate material on multiple deposits, uh, pull up a great sample size, find as many fossils as possible. And then really what they were looking at was uh, all the small mammals as well as uh, plants and insects to link that to climate change, environmental change, all that sort of stuff. So Laura's gonna talk about more about that stuff uh, that we find later on. Uh, but what was necessary was that we excavated enough to produce uh, enough material for that sample size. So we've pulled out thousands of remains because the box uh, sediment and uh, matrix level originally started up here and we excavated and removed and measured thousands and thousands of fossils of things like bison, baby bison, horse, baby horse, giant ground sloth, baby sloth, uh, there was mountain lions and squirrels and rabbits and weasels and plants and insects. All that was located in this deposit as we were excavating. And what we do is we measure the larger remains and specimens of a specific size that are a little bit smaller, we don't measure and we collect. So when we're excavating, we'll set up a grid system, which is represented by these uh, pieces of string right here. And so they're about a meter uh, north by a meter west, and our levels are 25 centimeters in depth, and all of our measurements are based off of this grid layout. Uh, so you can see this is A2, A3, B2, and B3, and then different levels as we go along. We're, right now we're down in level five, which is over a meter down. Um, and as we excavate, there's sterile material, kind of where I'm sitting in uh, right here, that doesn't contain a lot of asphalt and doesn't contain any visible fossils. So the first thing that we'll do is we'll take our hammers and chisels and we'll knock through all that material relatively quickly. So we remove all of the sterile sediment and make a flat floor so that we can kneel and sit comfortably. And then when we get to the fossils, the asphaltic or tar sand fossils, uh, the asphaltic fossils are all contained in this dark material saturated with asphalt and it takes a lot longer to get through all of this material. So A level in here, because this is so dense and so hard to get through, is taking us about eight months to finish. And we usually get about 2000 fossils per level. And so when we switch over to this section, we actually have to use chemicals to make it soft again so that we can excavate safely and not break all of the fossils. Um, so we pour that solvent, which is known as n bromide, onto the area that we're working. It'll soften it back up. And then we switch to tools such as this. So this is a dental tool and a little cup that we collect the matrix in. So we'll apply our solvent and then we'll kind of excavate and uh, whisk all of that sediments and grains 
into our little cup and then dump it into a dustpan as we go along. So this dustpan contains what we call matrix or all of the asphaltic sediments and potentially many other fossils inside that matrix. So we'll pile this up and then we'll organize it into buckets that are labeled, uh, you know, box, grid, level, all that sort of stuff and make sure that we have a location for all that material. Uh, so we only collect the asphaltic sands. That's what we, uh, that's what Laura's gonna talk about later is what we process. And uh, all the other sterile sediments, we pitch it, we get rid of it because um, it doesn't have anything in it. So um, when we do our measurements, we, uh, <clears throat> we're setting up uh, line levels and we're measuring out specific points on that fossil. So specifically today, we're gonna talk about a really cool fossil that we found, which is uh, actually a raccoon or Procyon lodor. And the raccoon fragments were found in this grid right here, B2 in level four. Um, and this, they were found back in 2018. And we measured out two fragments that were separated from each other and slightly offset. Um, and we actually could not, we didn't identify them correctly when we first found them. So when we first found them, because they, they were so dirty and so caked with matrix and uh, tar, and there were fragments, they were kind of pieces right next to each other. We thought it might be a coyote. So we labeled it all as coyote when we first took it out. And it wasn't until later, which Laura is gonna talk about that we started identifying it for what it actually was, which is uh, a, a raccoon. So we measured a couple pieces out and then one of the other pieces actually came out in the processing later. And um, yeah, so Hopefully we find more elements uh, and pieces of the skeleton of the raccoon in this deposit. So we have a lot more to go. We probably have a, uh, like five more feet worth of matrix uh, to excavate down into. And potentially because everything is jumbled up and mixed around, we might find other pieces of the raccoon farther down in the excavation. That's amazing, Sean. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to see the chat there, Sean, but a lot of our students are super excited as a raccoon and I think super surprised that we're talking about a raccoon because I think some of our students are probably familiar with raccoons today. So that's exciting to know that we still have them in the Ice Age. Um, so that's awesome. Thank you so much, Sean, for giving us um, all the information about Project 23 and how it started. And I'm gonna let you move to um, your next location with Laura. We're gonna see you a little bit again for Q&A and I'm gonna share a slide right now while you move to the next workstation. So you all heard um, Sean talk about the raccoon and this is what it looked like when he found it. So this is Sean's hand right here holding a piece of the raccoon skull. So that piece is part of the back cranium. So if you all touch your head and you feel this hard part right here where your brain is, right? So where your brain is in there, it's being protected by this hard outer shell. So that's your cranium. Um, and that's what that part is back of the raccoon right there. So you can see how small that is. Obviously a lot smaller than ours because it's fitting in the hand of uh, Sean. And you can see how he pulled it out and he talked about how it's covered in matrix and asphalt. And it's easy to misidentify these fossils when they're this small and they're covered in all that matrix. Um, but Sean and Laura are super, super good at their jobs. Um, and they see thousands and thousands of fossils. Um, so once they recovered the other pieces, so there's three pieces that we found. Um, this was the first one that was found. Once they got the other pieces and then put them together, they realized what they had. Um, and Laura's gonna talk a little bit about that too, um, how special it is for us to find something like this, this raccoon. Um, so if you like jigsaw puzzles, if you like digging in dirt, if you like discovering things, then this is the place to be because every day Sean and Laura get to excavate in those boxes. Sean was in box 13 and get to excavate in there and pull those fossils out. Um, so we have Laura joining us. Great job in getting over to the workstation there, Laura. Seamless. <laughs> so now Laura's gonna take it away. I'm gonna go off screen again, I'll stop sharing and then you'll see me again in a little bit. Thanks, Laura. Hey, 
Thank you, Agnes. Uh, and thank you for letting us run across from one end of our compound to the other. So I'm still outside, but at a slightly separate work area. And here I want to talk about uh, what happens to all of that dirt that Sean was showing us that comes off as we're digging out the larger fossils that are measured out in place. Because again, one, we're human and potentially make mistake, but also we can't see every single fossil that's there. One, because some of them are too small, and also because some of them might still be covered with too much silts and sands and clay and asphalt that we just can't see them yet, which is why we're, as Sean was mentioning, we keep all of that sediment and it eventually goes to uh, my coworkers, Karen and Sean, who put it through our matrix processing area. And so they'll put it in a bucket like this that has a screen at the bottom. And uh, so they'll put batches of it at a time, still organized by exactly where it's from. And they'll lower that into a series of chemical washes uh, to eventually get most of the asphalt and especially the silts and clay separated. And by the time they're done with it, we end up with sediment that just is uh, basically sands and fossils. And uh, we end up filling these beautiful cans full of just beautiful sand and small fossils. But at the same time, just for storage and for organization, because just that one deposit was tens of thousands of pounds of dirt. So especially when we need to make sure to store everything very, very efficiently, as we're doing that matrix processing, what they'll do is pull out some of the very, very biggest rocks and still record them and keep information about them because those rocks help us understand um, where those stream channels that come off the Santa Monica mountains near us would have brought all of these sands and clays down from those mountains. And so those rocks hella, help us tell that story of that water. Um, and so we do still wanna keep them. So we'll actually put it through a series of screens and these are all stacked together or nested right now, but each of them has a different size mesh. And each size will go through and make recordings and understandings about what's in each of them. Um, and then as we go, things will get smaller and smaller and smaller until by the time we're done, we end up with, again, just those smaller sands that eventually some of our laboratory team uh, can work on. And I'm sure you'll hear more about that later. But again, while we're going through this material, we want to also pull out any of the larger fossils that are mixed with those larger uh, rocks. And we also want to make sure that they're kept very fragile and safe. And so like this one is a nice big piece of pond turtle shell. And it was fossils like these that got pulled out of the station. That was actually the first time that we realized that what we had wasn't a coyote, it was a raccoon. And in case you're feeling judgy about us, I just wanna make sure that it's clear that of the millions of fossils that we have in our large animals, coyote is the third most common. So when we're looking at our fossils, it's very mathematically probable that if it's something about coyote size, it's probably a coyote. And in fact, with something like a raccoon, the reason that it wasn't really even on our radar much on a day-to-day -day basis looking for it is that the only piece of confirmed raccoon fossil from our entire site, our millions of fossils, is I have a copy of it right here. So this one is an ulna. It is a bone of the front leg. If you notice, it looks kind of like a crescent wrench. You guys do this with your arm. That's what that bone helps you do, or a raccoon. This one is a juvenile ulna, or an ulna from a baby raccoon. And this one was found in 1973 in Pit 91. So Pit 91 was one of our excavation sites that was originally started in 1915 and then put on hold for a number of reasons and reopened in 1969. And we still work on it sometimes during the summer today. But because those fossils are safer, it's not our current priority. We're at Project 23. We have to worry about all these fossils in the boxes falling apart and that sort of thing. Um, but so this one bone in 1973 was our only clue that we might have raccoons fossils at our site. And so that's part of the reason why we were really expecting it. And so it wasn't until uh, my coworker, Karen, uh, who was working on this matrix processing, uh, was going through and pulling out the really big rocks and setting aside the fragile large fossils to make sure that they store more efficiently. And she found a chunk of maxilla, or it's the part of the skull that holds the upper jaw. And she looked at it, and because we look at fossils all day, every day, she noticed that there was something odd about it. Just the teeth weren't 
the same kind of teeth that she was usually seeing day after day. And so Karen actually took it in uh, to our comparative collection and was able to compare it to a whole bunch of skulls and say, hey guys, we have a raccoon. And then uh, the team inside the laboratory was eventually able to find more pieces of that. But I'll let you hear more about that in a couple of weeks. Um, but so that very first piece that let us know that we had raccoon fossils from box 13 of Project 23 was a tiny little piece of skull that helped us tell this larger story. And uh, I can talk forever, but I want to make sure that my timing is good. And uh, because all of these fossils in the grand scheme of things help us tell the larger story of Rancho La Brea, because it's not just the very large animals like the saber tooth cats and the mammoths and the sloths that help us tell our story, because those large animals might wander hundreds of miles during their lifetime and just so happen to die here. But it's a lot of those smaller animals that spent more of their lives right here where we are today. And what's cool is most of those smaller things are not extinct. They're still extant or still around today. So just like some of you may have seen raccoons before, just like I have, just like we saw that little video of some raccoons over at our sister museum, the Natural History Museum, hanging out at night and washing their hands in one of the water features. We still have many of these animals. And that also means that we can still understand the changes that have happened between the last couple of tens of thousands of years. Because tens of thousands of years sound like a really long time. But to paleontologists, that's like geologically last weekend. So these stories that we understand from our recent past help us better understand our present. And then we're able to use those stories to help us then better understand our future where we're trying to understand how things like climate change that you may have heard mentioned once or twice ever, understand how these things are affecting all of the animals that we share our city with. Things like raccoons. And I do wanna make sure that we have time for some questions and answers. So thanks so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Laura. Thank you so much, Sean. That was all so fascinating. And the students in the chat also thought so because we are raking in the questions. Um, so to get started here, Jalen and Carter kind of had similar questions about the raccoon that was found. Um, Jalen wanted to know how big is the raccoon's brain? And Carter was wondering how big were the raccoons that lived during this time? Were they kind of similar size to the raccoons that we see today? Yeah, so um, for many of the species that are still extant, they have a long, deep history in uh, some of them North America, but also some of them straight here, right near the Brea Tar Pits. So, you know, Laura was talking about how we find things currently that are still alive or extant today, such as, you know, there's golden eagles and weasels and all these other things. And some of them might have changed their size a little bit, um, but it's not going to be drastic. Like you wouldn't uh, look at it and not know that it was a raccoon. Um, so modern day raccoons uh, get up to around 20 pounds or so. Uh, they're the exact size and weight of their brain. I'm not sure. Uh, we only find the bones, <laughs> so we don't find their brains. Uh, we could make an endocast, uh, which is essentially you can uh, make, you can insert a resin into the skull and then have a, you'd have to slice it in half, but then you could have the brain come out as a little cast material, which would be cool. But uh, I don't know the exact size of a raccoon's brain off the top of my head. But yeah, um, the big big raccoons get up to around 20 pounds. And so the, the Pleistocene raccoon that we found in uh, box 13, which is probably around 32,000 years old based on other things that were dated, is gonna be very similar in size. It's not gonna be much larger or much smaller. And one thing I do wanna add is that we're an active research site. So uh, this is, we're sharing the story that we know about the raccoon at this time. But we actually have one of our researchers that this week is currently starting to do research on our raccoons. And this raccoon will be part of that research. So I'm sure that we'll have more understandings about the comparisons between this raccoon and modern raccoons very soon. Keep listening. That's great. Um, so lots of questions, as Cassie said. Um, so one of the first grade class, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know what, what class it is, but they're curious about how you spot the fossils within the dirt or the tar. Um, and what is tar actually made of? So do you have like an eagle eye where you're like, there's a fossil because it is dirty and super messy in there. So how do you spot those? 
Um, so my, my short answer is practice. Uh, but my long answer is still the practice, but the fact that we are here all of the time, getting to see the difference between what bone looks like, what rocks look like, what insect material looks like, what freshwater snail shells look like, what plant fossils look like. The fact that we're seeing these things over and over again means that our eyes are really good at just seeing a little bit of something and being like, oh, that's the right transverse process of a saber-toothed cat third thoracic vertebrae. Um, so practice, again, being the short answer. But so a lot of it is just learning the differences in, a, in appearances. And a lot of that we learned here and seeing these particular fossils and what each of them look like and then mixed with silts and sands and clays and rocks and learning to kind of see the different personalities of the different sediments. Is there anything you want to add? Yeah, and uh, the, the asphaltic sediments or tar can obscure fossils. So sometimes you don't see them. That's usually for the smaller stuff. Um, but then also out here we have what's called tentative identification. So everything that we identify outside in excavations, because everyone understands how dirty and hard to identify it is out here, is just temporary until it's fully prepared and cleaned and curated. And then they'll make a final identification, uh, usually using comparative material of other things that have previously been found. So it's not just us on the team. There's many other people involved that help check and double check each other. Awesome, perfect. So this is an interesting question from Ariana. Um, Ariana wants to know if fossils could have bacteria on them and can you just pick them up with your hands? Um, do you have to worry about any sort of bacteria or germs on these fossils that you're digging up? Yes, sir. So um, to start with, this is a complicated question, but there are tons of microbes that live in the asphalt or tar themselves. So there are extremophiles, there's archaea, bacteria, all sorts of little teeny tiny things that actually live currently in the asphalt. And they uh, break stuff down that's uh, in there or they'll actually use different, uh, they'll feed on different chemicals that are part of the chemistry of the asphalt. So there's already a ton of living things uh, that are around the fossils and the asphalt all the time in modern day. If the question is, do we find fossil bacteria? No, we haven't uncovered fossil bacteria. It probably wouldn't survive because it's such a, there's so many microbes already living in the asphalt that they would continually be broke down uh, over time. So we don't have a fossilized version of bacteria next to the fossilized raccoon skull because the, Oil and natural gases are continuously seeping around all of the fossils um, and constantly bringing in uh, new oil and gas material, which is also going to move around different uh, microbes and such. So that what the oil is actually made out of is, um, or tar, uh, tar is crude oil. And oil is made because, again, microbes in this area was underwater. LA was underwater during the Miocene about 15 million years ago. And the microbes living in the water table were dying and sinking to the bottom of the LA basin. And it was what's called anoxic, meaning just there's not a lot of oxygen. Essentially, it just means there wasn't anything living down there that could break down the microbes that were falling down the bottom. So the bodies of these little microorganisms were piling up with the sediment that was burying them. And this organic matter eventually with enough burial cured into uh, oil and natural gas. And this took many millions of years. And then the, uh, the oil found passageways to get to the surface because this area is very tectonically active and we have earthquakes. And then we also have bedding lanes that are coming up to this specific spot. So all the oil and natural gas are uh, through pressure being squeezed up to the surface and the oil, uh, the lighter elements evaporate away and you get this crude sticky material, which we refer to as asphalt or tar. And we don't want to be having that on our hands and then eating. So that's part of the reason that we wear the gloves while we're excavating. And then in case we are doing uh, work in an area where we do have to use those chemical solvents, we also don't want to be putting those solvents on our hands just to keep the chemicals away from us. Um, but then also in case we're doing any uh, studies that they want to try to look for different things in the bones, we try to keep as much of our DNA off of the fossils in case they're trying to look for other things that they haven't been able to find yet, just so that we're keeping ourselves and the fossils as separate as possible, but we can handle them with our hands safely. Uh, we just mostly make sure that we wash our hands really well before we eat. 
washing hands just like raccoons do, right? Yep, yep, exactly. Oh, you have a little raccoon there. I love it. <laughs> um, Sean, you had mentioned um, the age of the raccoon. I think you said 20-something thousand years old. So Daryl's interested about how do you determine their age and how do you know how old they are? So I guess when they lived and then if it's a juvenile or an adult. Yeah, it's um, the fossil's probably around 32,000 years old, and that's because we've had a couple specimens in that deposit that were radiocarbon dated. So uh, this gets a little complex, but essentially we don't actually do that. We go to a physicist uh, that has an accelerated mass spectrometer, which is just essentially a big machine that can uh, spin radioactive isotopes in, uh, of carbon. So carbon breaks down, the radioactive stuff breaks down into more uh, stable isotopes. And by counting the numbers of radiocarbon versus uh, you know, regular carbon, you can get an idea of how old it was. And so the physicists like Dr. John Southern at UCI, the University of Irvine, uh, help us do pretty much all of the dating currently. Um, so that's how we know how old the fossil is uh, directly. And then for understanding the developmental age of an animal, uh, especially a mammal, uh, so mammals, uh, you know, grow and develop uh, through time. And when they're really young, they actually have more bones in their body than when they're uh, much older. And that's because they're growing and they need space to grow. So a thing like uh, ulna, which is what Laura showed you previously, which is like the only other bone of a raccoon ever found at the Brea, it'll have a proximal end or closer to the body and then a distal end. And the distal end and the proximal end have different ossification centers than the shaft of the bone. So there's actually three bones that later on will fuse into one bone as it, it becomes an adult. So if the uh, so if it if it's not fully fused, that means it's not fully an adult yet. Um, but if it is fully fused, then we know it's an adult, and then we can kind of sort of figure out how old the specimen was based off of that. Perfect. And then kind of to follow up on that, a lot of our students, Sophia, Jaden, Chance, and Christian, are asking, "What is the oldest fossil that we've found?" So uh, we're actually not sure about the exact oldest fossil that we find because that carbon-14 radiometric dating that Sean was talking about really starts bumping into limits for where you can use it around 50, 55 ish thousand years ago. So some of our fossils are just older than 47,000 or older than 50,000 years old. So they could be 55, they could be 60, but we don't know for sure because we bump into where the limit of that is but it's convenient for us that we know that it's going to be less than 100,000 years ago if it's something that walked around on the land because that ocean that Sean was mentioning was right here where we are until about 100,000 years ago. So if it walked around the land, we know it's at least younger than that. So we know that these are you know, millions of years old, even if they're slightly older than 50,000 years old. Um, yeah. Careful. So the raccoon is super interesting, but the students are also very interested in both of you. Um, and you're clearly inspiring some um, young students to kind of want to venture off into career paths such as yours. Um, Miss Emma Dora's class was curious to what you all studied to get into being able to dig for fossils and learn more about them. Yeah, so I went to school in San Diego and I studied uh, anthropology or the study of humans uh, with the, more of an emphasis on osteology, human remains, as well as archaeology or digging up uh, artifacts of humans. And then I minored in geology, which is the study of earth dynamics and rocks and things like that. So essentially, I'm really into bones, I'm really into rocks, and La Brea is the place for me. Sorry, we don't have as many people fossils, but we have, yeah. you know, millions That's of other okay. things. That's I like paleo cool. better now. <laughs> <laughs> You've just broadened your scope into all kinds yes. of animals and plants too. <laughs> um, and so I come from a similar background. I come at paleontology more heavily from the biology side with an emphasis in ecology and evolution. But I will say that the bulk of things that I learned about the tar pits specifically, I learned being able to actually volunteer here. Uh, back in like 2006, so a little while ago, before some of you were born. It's okay, I just feel old. Um, and so the practice of seeing these things over and over again taught me a lot about these particular fossils, which is also why, like, if you ask me something about, like, 
what part of a dinosaur is this? I may be able to make a good guess, but I'm not going to be as good as if you say, what part of a dire wolf is this? I'll know that one a lot more because that's what I've seen thousands and thousands and thousands of. Uh, but so a lot of that is just kind of finding things that you love doing, uh, that you're good at, and then finding someone to pay you to do it, hopefully, and maybe doing it for free along the way, just to learn some experience and that sort of thing. So that's how we ended up where we are. Yeah, and uh, just to add on to that a little bit, because people ask me this a lot, um, there's kind of like different stages of uh, staff positions. So we're the preparators. Usually you have around a bachelor's degree, and then uh, the next step is collections managers. Usually they have a master's degree, and then the next step is curators and postdocs, and they usually have a PhD or doctorate. Great. Um, and kind of following up on that, two questions. So Jacob is curious about how old you have to be to work there. Laura, you said you started there a while ago. Um, so how old do you have to be to work there, or perhaps volunteer? And then I think I know the answer to this question, but Jaden is curious, is it fun looking for fossils? Uh, so I'm going to start with this one. So uh, volunteering inside, once our program is back up and running, we're still getting that back together. Uh, but inside, the youngest we can take is 16. Outside, the youngest we can take is 18 because you get locked in a cage with us. Um, but otherwise, that's the youngest volunteers that we have. Our oldest volunteers are in their 70s now. So we have a nice wide range of people that we get to hang out with and talk about science. Um, but that is one of the things that I love about our job is that we get to work with such a wide variety of people with a wide variety of backgrounds and personal stories. And we also get to share our story with the public and get people excited about science. And we get to dig up buried treasure for our job, which I, I'm pretty excited about still. I've been doing it for almost 16 years now, and I still love it. So, Yeah, I, uncovering a fossil that no other human being has ever seen before is never gets old, especially when you find something really rare like a raccoon or a mountain lion or a baby mastodon or something like that. It's always a ton of fun. Um, I think we might have time for one more quick question. Um, do you have a, I guess for each of you, do you have a favorite fossil that you've ever found and why is it your favorite? Uh, yeah, I found a mountain lion skull a few years back and it was really uh, kind of amazing. We find a lot of skulls of coyotes and dire wolves and things like that. And when I first started working on it, I thought it was going to be another dire wolf skull. And then as we continued to excavate, uh, its snout all of a sudden just ended abruptly. And when we were able to pull it out, we were like, this is no dire wolf because the snout should be much longer. This is actually a cat. Um, so what cat could this be? And then we eventually settled on it. It has to be a mountain lion. And then we used comparative to make sure that, that uh, identification was accurate. So we found a mountain lion in the same box as the raccoon. Uh, so that box is kind of amazing. It's been producing a ton of really uh, rare and really nice specimens. And that mountain lion skull is one of only two near complete skulls in the entire collections, even though we have millions of fossils. Um, and I was lucky enough to pull, be the one that measured that out. So yeah, that was a ton of fun. And then also I really like the baby mastodon as well. It's just, it's just so young. It, uh, it's very interesting pulling out an animal that when you know when it grows up, it's going to be many thousands of pounds and be way taller than you and finding a, a tibia or shin bone that's only this big. And then for me, as you all know, uh, I don't have a favorite fossil because I have excavated literally tens of thousands of them through my time here. Um, but I do have a favorite animal, which you guys actually let me do a fossil finds on them for Valentine's Day a couple years ago. Uh, so the dwarf pronghorn, which is an extinct type of pronghorn. It kind of looks like an antelope, but it's not an antelope, whole different thing. Um, but uh, they, we're about this big or so. And if I, if they weren't extinct or all gone, I would be that classic LA girl with the oversized purse and the little head sticking out because they're just the cutest thing ever. And Sean knows when I found one because he can hear me like squeak a very excited little squeak. So they're my favorite. That's great. Thank you guys both so mm -hmm. much for joining us today. Um, so many questions we didn't get to answer. Um, so many scientists out there, curious scientists out there. Um, but thank you both. We learned a lot about the raccoon today. This was awesome. And um, I'm going to switch now to share my screen again.
All right. So again, once again, thank you to Sean and Laura for answering your questions. Oh, and I meant to say, I saw Isadora said that her school mascot was the raccoon. So that's super exciting. Um, and thanks again to all of our students for submitting all those great questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them today. There was just a lot, which I love. Um, so now that you've been introduced to our animal, the amazing raccoon, here's where we would like your help. So on your screen, you can see some images of paleo art that we had fun drawing actually at our museum. So paleo art is artistic work that attempts to depict ancient life according to scientific evidence. So the evidence we looked at today was the raccoon skull. So we would love to see your drawings of what you think our Ice Age raccoon looked like and have your teacher send them to us at this email address, schoolprograms at tarpits.org within the next week. So by next Tuesday, May 3rd, we would love to get all of your drawings. And then in two weeks, we're gonna have our second episode on May 10. So we're gonna feature some of your drawings on that episode. So be sure to tune in again on May 10th at 11 a.m. And hopefully you'll see some of your drawings. Um, and then we're also going to have, ask you to help us as we continue this journey of this amazing animal, the raccoon. Um, so I'm just going to tease that a little bit, but we're definitely going to ask your help on May 10 to help with this journey as we see this raccoon all the way from its excavation into the lab and then where we're going next with it. I know some students were curious about what we do with our fossils after we excavate them, so we're going to talk about that again um, a little bit in two weeks. So we hope you can join us then. But in the meantime, if you want to see more from our fossil preparators, you can give them a follow on Instagram. They're at La Brea Tar Pits. And we also have all of these videos from our presentations on our YouTube channel for you to watch later. So you can catch this recording and others at youtube.com slash La Brea Tar Pits. So we look forward to having you join us again on May 10th for our next episode in our webinar series where we will go inside the lab and we're going to ask for your help on something. So be sure to, to tune in in two weeks on May 10. And again, thank you all for joining us today and we hope to see you again soon. Enjoy the rest of your day.